How's it going guys? In today's video, we're gonna talk about the Darwin Carpet Python, also known as Morelia spallata. Now, as the name suggests, these guys are native to Darwin, as well as just all throughout Northern Australia, ranging from the Kimberley regions all the way to Northwest Queensland. Their habitat generally consists of anything from forests to woodlands and even savannas. They are a semi-arboreal python, so they can be found both on the ground and up in trees, in hollow logs, in rocky outcrops, all that sort of stuff. They're considered a medium-sized snake as far as Australian pythons go. They get around seven feet, sometimes eight feet long. Their diet will generally consist of mammals, rodents, marsupials, birds, as well as fruit bats. Now these are a pretty long-lived snake. They can live on average over 20 years and sometimes up to even 30 plus years. So if you want to keep one of these as a pet, there are a few things you need to take into consideration before getting one, as these are a long-term investment. Now Darwin carpets come in a few different colors. This particular one is a reduced pattern albino Darwin carpet. Um, now what makes it reduced pattern is normally an albino Darwin has a base color of white with yellow stripes. However, this one being a reduced pattern, it doesn't have much of the yellow stripes. It's predominantly white. I found down more towards its tail end, it's got more yellow, but up the front end of its body, it's mostly white with very minimal yellow. Where this one is what we would call a het albino Darwin. Um, basically, het albino in the Darwins at least is more or less a very washed out color. It's what I like to call the color of newspaper. Lots of grays and blacks. That's about it. Very reduced red or like light or dark brown in general. Not much yellows either. It's a fairly washed out sort of color. So it's kind of like the color of newspaper. This one's also a male and this one is a female. You can kind of tell the difference here. Um, like with a lot of pythons, the females generally are a bit bulkier and a bit bigger than the males. So my male is about the same length as this female. They're both around the seven to eight foot rough sort of length, but She's a fair bit thicker than him, and that's just how it goes for your, your pythons for, mo for the most part. And we have this one here as well. Now this one is kind of your more typical albino. It's not a reduced pattern, it's just your kind of more standard albino Darwin. You can see the yellowing in this one is much more prominent compared to my much larger female here. <laughs> These are getting so heavy, guys. Um, now, like I said, there are a few types of colors of Darwins. There's also the naturalistic type color, which is what you would find in the wild. I don't have that one. It kind of looks very similar to my Het Albina here. Just the yellows and the browns are a bit more like bold and colorful, but otherwise it's very similar to this. So next thing to take into consideration is the enclosure size for these. Now, long-term, they're gonna need a reasonable sized enclosure. These are also a semi-arboreal snake. So like I said, they can get up to eight foot. If especially you get a female, males generally around seven. You're gonna need something at least four foot by two foot by two foot, if not even a bit bigger, if you can go a six by two by two, uh, even better. If you can go taller than two foot tall, even better again, but two foot tall is generally enough. But these are semi-arboreal, so they are gonna climb, so um, account for that. Have lots of climbing branches in their enclosure. I find the amount they climb is very much varied between one to another. This little one here climbs a lot. He's probably like 80% up on his branches, hardly ever comes to the ground. This female, kind of the opposite, it's on the ground a lot. The male head albino is 50-50 on the climbing and I have another albino Darwin, another little male, that is probably like 80% on the ground. So it varies a lot, but give them the option to climb because they technically are semi-arboreal. So have lots of uh, climbing branches that are strong enough to support their weight because they are kind of a hefty uh, python once they're bigger. Other than that, you want, to pro you want to provide them with a nice big water bowl, big enough they can fully soak themselves in and submerge themselves, as these guys do actually like to soak in their water from time to time. Give them a couple of hides, one on the warm end, one, one on the cool end. And speaking of the warm end, we're going to talk about temperatures next. So you want to provide them a basking spot or a warm spot, whether that be provided by a ceramic heater meter, a heat lamp or a heat mat. You want that to be anywhere from you want that to range between 32 and 36 degrees Celsius with the cooler end of the enclosure dropping down to about 22 to 25 degrees Celsius, roughly. If you can provide them with a UVB light, whether that be a UVB coil or a T8 or T5 UVB light tube, go for a 5.0 UVB. Now look, these guys don't technically require a UVB light. Carpet pythons can live 
a perfectly fine life without them, but there are some health benefits to UVB light, as well as it does tend to bring their colors out a little bit better. So if you are able to, and I would personally recommend it, provide them with a UVB light if possible. So humidity for these is around 40 to 50%, so it's not actually a hard humidity to replicate, as I guess depending a little bit on whereabouts you live, but for the most part, that's kind of the humidity that is in most places anyway, unless you're living in a very tropical climate, in which case for most people, 40 to 50% humidity is kind of the norm for their like home anyways. So you don't really have to stress about humidity for these too much, unless of course you live somewhere where the humidity gets very low, like below 40%. In that case, you might want to um, you might want to go with a malamine enclosure over a glass one, as they tend to retain humidity much better. Now, when you get a younger one of these, like a little hatchling, they're only going to be about 15 to 20 centimeters long. You're going to keep it in preferably a hatchling box. Uh, they tend to do much better in those. These are about the size of a shoebox, um, where you have a little heat mat under the back end of the hatchling box. You have the water bowl up the opposite end, a couple of hides, maybe a branch or two to climb on, and that's about it. And you want to keep them in that for at least the first year to the first year and a half. And once they reach that kind of foot and a half to two foot sort of size, provided they've been doing well, they're eating fine, they're not shy with you at all, you know, they're used to you and all that, you can then move them into their bigger enclosure, which would be like the four by two by two, for example. And they should do fine for you, but I would not recommend putting a little hatchling in a big enclosure. They tend to just go off their food, they become very shy and reclusive, and they just, yeah, often don't thrive. They don't do very well. Keep them in the hatching box for at least a year or two before moving them up to the big enclosure. And once they reach their sub-adult size, so maybe a little smaller than this little fella here, you know, around a foot and a half to two foot long, you can move them into something a little bigger, either their six by two by two or their four by two by two. Or like I said, one this big, I could put in a six by two, no problem. He'd do quite well, provided it was set up properly. Now feeding these guys is pretty straightforward. Darwin's are pretty good feeders. You know, like as a hatchling, again, they're going to be, as a hatchling, they're going to be eating uh, pinkies initially. Then you just up the size of the rodent as they grow. And as adults like this, they'll be eating like a large sized rat. You can also feed them quail. Hatchlings, you'll be feeding weekly a pinky or a fuzzy mouse. And once they get into the kind of sub-adult sort of size, so around four foot long, um, you can drop them down to every two weeks if you want to, or you can keep them on a weekly feeding if you want them to grow a little bit quicker. And as full grown adults like this female, you can feed them every two to three weeks. During the colder times of the year, like winter, you can let them go even every four weeks because they tend to just go a bit slower on the feeding than anyway, the metabolism has slowed down significantly. So you don't have to stress too much if you're only um, feeding them every three to four weeks during winter. But I do recommend during the warmer times of the year, try to do them at least every two weeks. Make sure they've fully passed their food through their system and pooped it out before you offer them the next feed as you can get a lot of issues with impaction and blockages if you're overfeeding your snake food. And the way to work out what sort of food they can actually manage, you just go off the fattest part of their body, the food you're feeding them, whether that be a rat or a quail. If it's fatter than the thickest part of their body, that's probably a little too big for them. Not saying they can't squeeze it in, but as a regular sort of food, that's not something you wanna be offering them every single time. So rule of thumb, if it's fatter than the thickest part of their body, probably don't feed them stuff that size all the time. Once in a while is fine if that's just what has, has to happen. If it's like the last rodent you've got in your pack and it happens to be a tiny bit bigger than the usual, they can probably manage it, yeah, but you don't want that to be their normal size food. So try to keep it a bit thinner than their body if possible. Now going back to the decor of their enclosure, like I said, lots of climbing branches, a couple of hides and a big water bowl. These are the basic needs for these snakes to be happy and not be stressed out while they're in their enclosure. But regarding the decor, you can make, as, you can make the enclosure as decorative as you like. Bearing in mind, as you can see, these are a decently sized snake. They're quite heavy bodied. You can't really do a bioactive sort of thing with these as they're just going to destroy any live plants you put in there or just crush them within a day or two. You can go with fake plants if you want. Probably want to get some pretty sturdy fake plants and they're still going to kind of flatten them so you'll have to kind of fix them every now and again. But try to have the enclosure reasonably spaced out when they're bigger. Don't have it filled with lots of little ornamental things. They're just gonna destroy them anyways. And with their branches, make sure they're nice and thick and sturdy and they're not gonna fall over because they are kind of heavy. And I would say they can be a bit cumbersome sometimes when they're bigger. So you don't want them to be climbing up one of these branches and it, and it falls down with the snake. 
and the snake ends up getting injured. My branches are actually fixed into the enclosure. I've drilled them into the sides of the enclosure so they can't move, they're 100% stable. Like you'll probably notice in the enclosure just here behind me, these branches are all fixed in. Uh, that's a glass enclosure, I've actually siliconed them in. So they're not going anywhere. I've also got malamine enclosures which I've physically drilled big screws into the sides of the enclosure from the outside going in into the branch so they can't move. I tend to try to do that with all my enclosures especially with my larger snakes because larger snakes will just kind of bulldoze their way around and knock things over and sometimes the branch they're sitting on will be the branch that falls over because they're so heavy combined with a big thick branch it can result in injuries so just bear that in mind when you're setting these guys up especially once they're at this larger size. And lastly guys that is handling and temperament and I think it kind of speaks for itself here they're very placid snakes for the most part. Like I said, there's exceptions to the rule with everything and not all Darwins are the same. I've had a couple of Darwins that might be a little snappy on the odd occasion until you get them out of the enclosure, then they settle. This smaller one uh, can be a little bit cage defensive. Once I get him out, he's fine, perfectly placid. But you know, when you first go to get him, he does get a little defensive until he's out and then he settles. But my larger female, and my other uh, male head albino that I had out before, uh, and my I guess, smaller male albino, very calm, very placid, almost all the time. They're very slow moving, very deliberate the way they move. Um, great snake to handle. And being a semi-arboreal snake, they're going to kind of hang on to you. So there's not a high risk of dropping them like something that's a ground dwelling snake. Um, they're gonna kind of hang on. So to wrap things up, if you want a reasonably large Australian python that's semi-arboreal and comes in this beautiful albino colouring if that's what you're into, maybe a Darwin carpet python is the snake for you. That's my video on Darwin carpets guys, I hope you've enjoyed. Before I go guys, my buy me a coffee is down in the link if you would like to support my channel and make a small donation that would be much appreciated. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Until then I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.